Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Robin Oladort, and I'm here on behalf of Academic Technology to introduce this wonderful student panel that's brought to you by the Academic Technology Advisory Committee. This panel is called I Am Your Student. This is how I use AI, and we have four wonderful student panelists here who are going to talk about their use of AI, both in their personal time and in coursework. Um, and this, again, this event is sponsored by the Academic Technology Advisory Committee, and uh, we wanted to just bring up that this is one of many events that are hosted regarding AI on campus. Um, and we have an entire listing of these available on the Campus Response to AI website. That's ai.sfsu.edu. And events are found at the same URL, ai.sfsu.edu slash events. I'm also gonna post that in the chat. Uh, so with no further ado, let me introduce Andrew Roderick from Academic Technology who will get this panel started. Great. Thank you, Robin. And I'm Andrew Roderick. I oversee academic technology and I'll be moderating the panel today. Um, just before we start, too, I want to highlight that tomorrow CETL is hosting an academic integrity in the age of AI session, which is a really great counterpart to today's session. That's uh, that that's going to really focus on some of the faculty concerns around academic integrity. Um, so but let's go ahead and get started. I have a brief introduction. I'd like to set forward to get some context going, and then we'll jump in and hear from our panelists. I'll be reading some guiding questions to them, and we're hoping to leave some time at the end for some questions on your part. So do use the Q&A if you have questions for our panelists today, who are all SF State students. Um, as and I'm going to be kind of reading this, so <laughs> bear with me. Uh, as gender of AI has become a topic of interest in the popular media, so has it captured the attention of higher education. Our faculty and instructors are grappling with the impacts of this emerging technology, trying to adapt as it comes into their classrooms and as, employ as it is employed by their students. One overriding faculty concern is related to academic integrity and student cheating. For any range of programs, but particularly writing, coding, and other areas where coursework lends itself to the generative capabilities of applications like ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot, the impact has been disruptive and instructors have had to scramble for approaches that range from prohibitive to embracing to adaptive. Let's be clear, this is an emerging technology where the rate of change is week by week. I mean it, <laughs> it's true. All campuses, academic departments and individual faculty are slowly building responses, but it will take time. And our students, our students are using the technology and similarly trying to understand what it means to them in their coursework, in their studies, in their work lives, and in their future careers. We know anecdotally that some are cheating with the technology, but many are finding appropriate and innovative ways to use it that supports their learning and study. They're also looking forward to understanding how it may impact their careers. Let's keep in mind that students are not monolithic. Some amount of our students' population have little awareness or experience with AI, and this may also mirror the digital divide issues that we know are there. We as a campus want to ensure that those students are not left behind. As our faculty and students meet this emerging technology in the classroom and with coursework, the perspective of each group may be mysterious to the other. Faculty suspicion or concern about student use and perception of AI students feeling guilty or unsure about how to use it. Today's panel, I Am Your Student, This Is How I Use AI, intends to help move the needle on our understanding by presenting student use, perception, and needs around AI. While not, not entirely representative of our diverse student body, these four student panelists will provide a flavor for where our students are at. Let me introduce them. Ethan Cortez is a junior majoring in business management he leads the Emerging Technology Student Group and works in academic technology. And full disclosure, he'll also be leading some future series, uh, some future uh, student-focused workshops that are going to be offered directly to students. Um, Ethan is excited for what AI may mean to his future. Chris Leahy is a senior grad student in communication studies and also earning his graduate certificate in ethical AI, which is offered here at SF State, if you did not know. 
He's also completed a BA in communications here along with a minor in sexuality studies. His research focus covers the intersection of surveillance, capitalism, pedagogy, and how to engage students in the classroom using AI ethically and effectively, including what AI may mean and how it may address needs and voices in marginalized communities such as queer and trans people of color. Avi Mangalmurti is a sophomore in civil engineering. He transferred from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He is also decidedly pro-AI, wanting to know more about AI platforms and how they will impact his future and the future of his generation. And last but not least, Pranav Mattel is a recently graduated computer science student who transferred from an engineering university in India in 2022. Pranav is working with AI in the industry, building automation tools for uh, multiple kinds of knowledge work. And so these are all students who are a little more advanced in AI, but definitely are gonna give us a flavor for their perspectives on it. So let's hear from them right now. Uh, my first question to all of you is, in the advent of generative AI, uh, the advent of generative AI is creating different reactions with different people. Apprehensive, confused, excited, Give us a few adjectives about how AI is landing with each of you. I'll start with you, Avi. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Well, with this question, I am very excited about AI, and I really do want us, I mean, schools and universities to incorporate it more, as I feel a lot more can get done. And yeah, I'm very passionate about it, and I, I hope in the future that it is allowed. Thank you, Chris. I would say apprehensive, frustrated, sorry about that. I would say apprehensive, frustrated, bored, and underwhelmed. All right, we'll hear more from you about those. Uh, Pranav. Uh, I'd say I'm super excited uh, about the possibilities that this brings and like what it unlocks. Uh, yeah, I'd say generally optimistic about it. And last but not least, Ethan. Uh, so I would say intriguing, efficient, and viral. I'm really excited to see uh, how AI continues to um, spread uh, and influence, uh, you know, professional and school. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. So let's let's dive in and talk a little bit about your experiences you've had in classes or with instructors regarding AI. You probably had different experiences with different instructors, but you could share your impressions and how those experiences send a message to you about SF State and AI uh, to you each as a student. And why don't we go ahead and start with you, Pranav? Absolutely, yeah. I feel like I've had a whole host of like different kinds of experiences with AI uh, with with classes at SF State. Some which were like pretty overt about like not wanting us to use it, and some being not only just saying that you can use it, but kind of suggesting that you have to use it. And so I'm going to speak more about the latter because I think there's a lot to dig into for the former. So with regards to like classes that allow us to use it, I was I found it interesting to see a few classes in the computer science department encouraging us to like kind of definitely use it. And how they kind of moderated how we used it and how they monitored how we used it is that in a lot of tools like ChatGPT, you're able to like export the conversation that you had with AI to get to a certain point, to get to a certain generation or an answer. And that was part of the submission that we were supposed to turn in for the assignment. And I think that's a pretty interesting paradigm because the acknowledgement at the beginning of the class was you're going to be doing X, which is what we were learning in class. And there's no way you're not going to be using AI in industry. And this class is kind of existing to prepare you to do this in the industry. And so you should do it how you'd actually do it. And I think us being able to provide that transcript off the chat alongside the submission ensured that we didn't really like just go ahead and be and say like, oh, just give me the answer to this. We kind of had to arrive to the answer using it. So I think that's an interesting paradigm. And I'd say, I'd, I'd like to see more of that across a lot of classes. Thank you, Pranav. Ethan, I'll turn to you. So first thing I would like, to, I completely agree with Pranav. I'd love to hear that uh, SF State was really incorporating, um, you know, AI into classwork. Being a business major, I'm not seeing that as much. Um, you know, there's less of a discussion happening. Uh, but for me, I've been using AI regardless in my classes. Like my most recent use was just to create images for a slide deck. So they were more personalized images using Dolly. Um, and I'm always citing the AI as a resource, as a reference, um, which is what I think, you know, 
should be the basis of, of using AI, just like we're using any other resource. You're making sure to cite it and give credit where it's due. Uh, so I'm excited to hopefully see more of that um, and hopefully have faculty be more open to uses like that uh, within the class. Chris. Thanks for sharing, Parnav. Um, yeah, I would say, I can't say I've had many experiences outside my computer science classes, which have been generally supportive. <clears throat> excuse me, in using AI in the classroom. Um, in my AI explainability course, naturally, we had assignments, lectures, and discussions about AI ethics and uses. Um, the conversations were both helpful and limiting, and with the instructor being generally uncomfortable discussing political bias with generative AI, which is one of my complaints and critiques of AI in general. Um, my impression is that faculty are aware of, but generally don't want to or know how to discuss AI in the classroom, despite our resources on campus. Anytime I ask about class policies on AI, I usually get a vague but supportive response. I feel most instructors are unprepared and fear the vulnerability required to have these discussions with students. The most productive conversations I've had are with my tenure faculty in my department or in my graduate level courses. Compared to what I'm hearing from undergraduate students, there's an obvious mistrust and infantilization of undergraduate students that doesn't sit right with me. Overall, I'd say SFSU is generally flexible with AI literacy but feels inconsistent across departments. For instance, the English department seems to be struggling. Great, and Avi. So yeah, so I've, I basically had a great experience with AI, um, just in the sense of, for example, I, I, I believe a lot in thought generation and brainstorming and not having to work and work like understand formatting and all the other, nuances of the work, but just being able to get as many ideas as I can down on paper and then actually seeing where steps one and two relate to steps three and five, AI has really helped me with that. And not only with that, but as a, as a civil engineer, I'm, I'm involved a lot in design and there's a lot to do with prototyping. So having AI help me generate rapid prototypes and a lot of imagery and a lot of definitions and ways of thinking has really like helped me like um, really refine the design and like hopefully create create a better design for whatever it is I am designing. So yeah. Great. Um, thank you all. Um, let's move on to the next question. Issues with academic integrity and cheating are on the minds of faculty as they consider the technology and its impact on their teaching and coursework. Have you encountered cheating with AI in your classes or amongst other students? And how do you feel about the issue and how it um, creates a, a sort of uh, a perspective around AI as it as it is practiced here at SF State? And Chris, I'll start with you. Uh, so for a little background context, I'm both a graduate student and a graduate teaching uh, assistant. So I have a little bit of a dual perspective. So as a student, no, I haven't encountered any instances of cheating among students. Most students are too scared to use it or risk getting caught. I feel like that's kind of true as both an instructor and a student. And I would say as an instructor, it's also like we can't really prove it with accuracy whether or not they are cheating. So I personally don't really invest time in policing or shaming them on using it. I have more of an open stance on it in my classroom. Thank you. Uh, Ethan. So I want to start with going on, the fact, you know, cheating is going to be, in my mind, part of academics, uh, no matter what. And what I mean by that is students that want to cheat are going to cheat no matter what. Um, the, you know, this was putting a piece of paper under your leg, whatever it is, there's always something. Um, and I think now with AI, yes, it's become easier. But I don't think that that means that any more students are cheating. I think it's the same students that would have been cheating regardless. And I think that that's just doing a detriment to them uh, in the professional world. The students that are using AI now ethically are building a skill set that we're going to be using in the professional world. And I think it's important for a school to really help push that instead of just saying you can't use this technology, you know, you know, pushing this fear um, when I think it's going to continue to, you know, expand and become more popular. Um, and with the rest of it, I've seen cheating in classes, you know, in discussion posts like but when it comes down to it, I feel like it's pretty obvious. If you're reading your students' work and you're seeing the same response six or seven times, it's probably just a copy and paste into generative AI like ChatGPT or Copilot, and they're just spitting that response back out. Um, 
And so I think professors that are taking the time to really read responses are going to be able to discern if it's AI a little bit better. Um, and if they're unable to, then I would, you know, I don't think I would hope that the student wasn't using AI at that point because uh, AI's results at this point are not very good uh, and they're really unreliable. Um, I like a quick use case. There was a lawyer who cited six court cases um, and none of them were, were real. They were fabricated by Chad GPT uh, and he got sanctioned. It was a whole thing. So those people that are using this in a professional environment, it's just to their detriment. Um, yeah. Thanks, Ethan. Avi, your experiences. Yeah, so I think um, Ethan actually had like said that very well. The students that want to cheat, I mean, the, the students that are using AI to cheat are the students who are already cheating. I think that's very true. Um, with regards to students who are not cheating, just in my experience, they have like really taken the time to learn the platforms, understand whatever nuances it has. But I have seen in class where students will just literally deposit the question into the chat but, and then ask for a full summary, full paper, whatever it is. And then again, just reinforcing Ethan's, um, like he, he say there, like the students who cheat are the ones that are using AI to cheat. It's not, it's not that they're using it as a, to, to benefit anyone else. And Pranav. Yeah, I think like Ethan hit the nail on the head there. I think it's very, it, it, I, I, I echo what, like what we've said in that people who wanted to cheat now just have a better tool, a more efficient tool to be able to cheat. And yeah, they're, they were going to do it anyway through some other means and they do it now through like a much simpler means. But yeah, like I've definitely seen instances of like people who are, who are similar to the panelists here who've had a lot of exposure to AI and like they know that they can just deposit the question in, into the chat button and get an answer. But they're like, no, like, they're able to do some sort of critical thinking to discern that, okay, this seems like more of like a road task, which anyway doesn't have too much differentiated value in a context of broader knowledge work. And so it is okay to automate it away because we were going to build some tooling to do automate it at some point anyway. Whereas like this is reasoning skill that I need to apply towards this problem. And if I just get the chatbot to do it, then I don't learn it. And so there is like people who are thinking at a meta level deeply about the task they are carrying out will probably use these tools in the right way. And it's kind of important to use these tools in the right way because by using them now, you learn to use them. And by learning to use them, you're able to use them when you're supposed to later down the line, when you're outside the context and the safe confines of academia. And so I feel like it's very important to not curtail those who are trying to push what's possible, push the boundaries of what's possible in an effort to stop those who are going to cheat anyway. And from like a lens of like, uh, from the lens of like, uh, teaching experiences. I did teach a few courses at SS State, but they were before a lot of these chatbots caught on. But I've been actually having a lot of conversations with a few instructors that I had in the past, just catching up over. Uh, and like one of them was telling, sh sharing their very frustrating experience with like assessing a lot of like AI turned in work. So this is an instructor in the prof uh, in the philosophy department. And a lot of the questioning, like a lot of the assignments there are about like exercising your reasoning through means of writing. And so you're going to be given very open-ended problems to which there is no right or wrong answer. It's just through writing that do you come to like some realizations about your own thought process and you kind of have something that the professor can then like assess. And so he said it's like soul sucking for them to have to like read through all of these generated answers because it's like they spent a lot of effort into writing those prompts. But obviously a chat bot can do like a really good job at like answering them in some way. And so I completely have empathy for the other side. But I also reckon, but they also like in in that statement, you also recognize that it's very easy to pick out who just literally used the tool and never read the thing themselves. And so it kind of self-checks for cheating instances. I think the only way people are able to get through this without getting caught is if the instructor is also not doing a thorough job reading the responses. So yeah, that's my take. Thank you all. Um, just an add-on question. Um, one facet of dealing with the cheating issue is AI detection. And at San Francisco State University, we employ anti-plagiarism software called Turnitin that introduced an AI detection feature sometime last year. And so it's been in use in classes. I wanted to ask if any of you have encountered that in any of your classes and what that experience was like for you and maybe if you observe it, anything else within the class around that. Um, I saw a couple of you shaking your hands, but Avi, uh, sounds like you have had experience with that. 
So yes, I, I have had experience with Tenedin, even in my previous university, the University of Pretoria in, in South Africa, Tenedin was 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 the, uh, the the platform that we did use to check for uh, plagiarism. However, I did not um, like plagiarize any of the work or use ChatGPT for that paper. It was for my physics class. However, I am aware of some individuals who did, and they were obviously uh, dealt with accordingly, which I think is fair. But turn it in, uh, yeah, it, it it did a, a decent job in catching whoever those individuals were, with with um who who plagiarized through um ChatGPT, especially. Anyone else want to share any experiences with AI detection, Ethan? Uh, yeah, I quickly just wanted to add so. With Turnitin, the main instance I see with it is with my work um, when I'm at, when I'm conversating with instructors. And a big thing I feel the need to mention sometimes is that Turnitin itself acknowledges that it cannot detect AI reliably. Um, and there's a lot of instructors that just don't know this and use the detection. Um, you know, they might not even bring it back to the student, but they're using it to like they're just remembering that oh, this student was flagged for AI use, whatever it is. Uh, I just really want to put it out there that it's not reliable and there is no uh, technology that can scan for that AI right now. But I do think that it's possible, just like Pranav and Avi are saying, like instructors, I think, are really able to detect it better than any other you know, software is going to be. When you read something and it's that monotonous tone over and over again of just spitting out facts, there's no human element. Um, I think, you know, then it's AI. Great. Yeah, I'd say like strong echo towards that because like, even all the big labs, the AI labs that are working on building these chatbots, they've all acknowledged that there is no deterministic sure shot way to detect any of this using software. And so I generally take issue with software that kind of attempts to do that. But I think like good on Turnitin's part that they have kind of acknowledged that this is not reliable. But yeah, like 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 Ethan said, there's a communication issue in software because like, oh, people see the feature of detection. Great. Like now my problem is solved. And you don't read the fine print about it not actually working deterministically and using that as evidence for like citing people towards cases. I feel like that's created a lot of issues across universities in general. So I don't know if specific instances at SF State, but I know people get flagged for not having plagiarized anything at all or used uh, or having used any generative model to do it. But but that just happens. Great. And just a quick. So then I, I may be. A... Oh, go ahead, Avi. Oh so yeah. So then just just with that that information, I may be. A... Um, not actually sure about turning in then myself uh, myself with the responses of these two, but um, about turning in being able to detect. But I just want to make it known that uh, there were individuals who were caught using ChatGPT, and the detection software that was used was turned in. So I could be wrong, in if turning in was the one that found them out. But um, yeah, there were individuals who were caught in my class. But yeah, yeah thank you for sharing that, Pranav and Ethan. Thank you. And just a quick sidebar. Um, I'm a big believer that um, the next generation of AI tools are going to be a lot more discipline specific. And I think a lot of um, the faculty audience are very focused on uh, the generative production of writing. But Pranav, you being in computer science, I wanted to just sort of take you aside and sort of have you talk a little bit about the generation of code, which is sort of the phenomenon within computer science, and how you see that as being similar and different from the writing um, element of generation from applications like ChatGPT. Yeah, thanks for the question. I feel like that's like a huge, huge talk within industry right now as well. So I'd say like short answer to, for me is that the profession of like the practice of writing code in industry or in classrooms is going to change a lot. Like it's not going to be nearly the same as what it looks like today. We will be using, like I can say with certainty, we will be using these tools. We are already using these tools. Like there's like incredible adoption metrics across like a lot of like top performing companies for using these tools to generate code. And with code, I feel like the, to, to like contrast that with like writing, it's a lot more utilitarian. Like the code you write, you don't write it to look at the code that nobody really cares about the code. It, it matters more what the code gets done. And so the models will be able to write code that works and does a good job to a certain capability today. That capabilities boundaries are going to get pushed more and more as time passes. And we're going to be able to write more and more like capable programs that are able to do more complicated things than we are today. But even today, what we can do is pretty amazing. So 
uh, I'd say that creativity matters less in code unless you're like trying to like assess whether somebody knows how to write it. But if you're just trying to get a job done, it is effectively going to be able to do a lot of what a lot of what like a junior software engineer does today. But just we a chatbot. We're not there yet, but I'm pretty optimistic we'll be there like very very soon. Thank you, thank you. And I think the kind of the highlight there too is that um, in our different disciplines, um, there being some are being impacted more than others right now. But um, a lot of the tools that we see, like ChatGPT, are very general AI focused tools. And increasingly, you'll see very task specific tools that are going to adhere to very specific practices and fields and disciplines. And, um, and so I think everyone needs to be aware of that. And we are encouraging departments and programs to begin to prepare for that in their own way, wherever that is. And I want to highlight the journalism department, which held an AI day for their students last semester and brought in people from the outside industry to talk about how AI was being used and impacting the field of journalism to really help uh, prepare their students uh, from a workforce standpoint. And um, I think that was a really important um, uh, thing for them to do and a really important example for the university. Um, I want to kind of segue from that into the next question, which is um, to hear from all of you about how you see AI impacting your future, uh, both as a uh, continuing on as a student in the near term, but also for your future professional life. Do you see AI impacting your field of study and the types of job you may take after you graduate? And what does that mean to you now? Um, and I think I'll start with you, Chris. Thanks for that, Andrew. I would say, I think generative AI specifically, because we use AI as like an umbrella term to encapsulate a lot of things. But for those who don't know, generative AI is like ChatGPT, Google's Gemini, et cetera. Um, will continue to enhance my educational experience. I primarily use it as brainstorming tool or to help me organize my ideas or, again, with coding. Um, otherwise, I do see AI significantly impacting my field of communication studies, which intersects a lot of diverging career options, um, specifically journalism, as Andrew mentioned, media, social media management and public relations. We're already seeing massive layoffs as well as automation. My discipline, like many others, is not adequately preparing students for our evolving workforce. The lack of practical skills and application-based courses will have a negative impact on my future employment. In many ways, I feel like my time and money would be better spent on Google certifications than a college degree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ethan, you next. So for tools like that, I want to honestly go back to what Andrew was saying. And I think to a degree that's already here when we're looking at ChatGPT, just their GPTs. Um, if anyone has ChatGPT4, those lists of GPTs, which are really specific, um, you know, designed for specific use cases, I think that's going to continue to evolve very quickly. Um, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. Uh, I, I think every industry, I don't think this is limited to like one or two. I think this is, I think every professional industry is going to be very, very influenced by AI. Um, I think it's already starting today and we're seeing that kind of phase in, um, that adaptation of AI is really starting to spread. Um, I'm excited to see where that goes. Uh, I think for me personally with business, uh, it's a little bit more general. Um, so I think generative AI is already used within my major for research, idea generation, uh, resource gathering, et cetera. Uh, and I'm excited to see how much more specific it can get. Um, I know personally, you know, like stock trading is something I'm really interested in. I'm excited to see how, you know, generative AI is going to be able to mess with that. Um, so we'll see. It's, it's a really exciting time. Mess with that. <laughs> I like it. Um, Avi, you. So yeah, so I'm I'm very for AI coming towards the the civil engineering industry, especially for structural engineering. Um, however, I I do not see yet a, a possibility with AI, um, directly impacting the, the 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 sphere of civil engineering with respect to structural because of design. I feel that um, design is still very difficult for AI to use. However, but for accuracy and precision in terms of like building or modeling. I see AI being very efficient and effective in that way. But for design, again, I, I do hope that AI will get there so that we can, yeah. yeah. Pranav. 
yeah um i just graduated uh, and like i'm now like using ai every day in industry and i feel like yeah it's going to it's already changing a lot like what we thought we were going to be doing in the workforce is like very different from what i'm actually doing on a day-to-day basis and i think that's generally always been true because like school always lags behind industry in general but now with the advent of these tools it's been kind of eye opening like it's it's been like well, wow, like I, I'm pretty sure I would not be doing this like had this not been invented. So um, my general belief is that it's probably like late to say that the industry will change. It has already changed. And so like people are already like doing jobs differently. And I think I'm maybe biased more towards like various kinds of knowledge work. It's ironic because people, when they thought about automation initially, were like, oh, like, you know, delivery is going to be done by drones or whatever. And then suddenly we're at the cusp of, the time where like white collar workers are the first who's going who are going to have their jobs automated away, but like not to go that dystopian and not to go to that extreme end of the spectrum. I feel like we're going to need way fewer people to do tasks than we needed before. So like software engineering is still probably going to be a thing. It's going to evolve a lot as a profession. But my belief is that people are not going to need that many people to write code. Uh, companies are not going to need that many people to write code, and we're going to be able to get more done with fewer people. And so that creates questions around like. For the last decade or so, a large, large chunk of it in the Valley, we've seen a huge, like huge chunks of people going to computer science and software engineering as their undergraduate career paths. Some of them who weren't even interested in it because they were like, this is like an easy, short shot way to get a six-figure job. I feel like the industry does not or will not want that many people who will be graduating out of these programs. So it's like a good time to question, like, what is it that we want to study and why is it that we're studying it? Uh, but I also don't think like all jobs are going away. It's just that the nature of them is going to change drastically in all kinds of knowledge work. Thank you all. I'd like to linger on this for a second. I'm kind of hearing you all respond in a kind of a prognostication, clinical kind of way, but I want to come back to it and hear, what does that mean to you? Is that, I mean, are you concerned for your future in terms of work? Are you excited about it um, in terms of what it means to you to be able to bring that? And and I mean, bring it, I, I'd like to hear it from the perspective of you as an SF State student and what you think SF State needs to be doing for you to be preparing you for this kind of future that, that workforce that you're kind of all talking about. But, I, you know, talk about a little bit more what it means to you. I, any of you can kind of pop in and answer it that way. Uh, so what I want to add about that for me, I'm really excited for where it's going to be taking me. Um, and I feel like I'm saying that because I'm involved with AI. I, I you know, I experiment with it, but I, I wouldn't say that for a lot of the other students on this campus who, you know, are barred away from AI or pushed away from it, uh, not only by the like, instructors, but by the university as a whole, not being a hundred percent, you know, progressive with AI telling students to use it. Um, the fact that I use it now on my day-to-day in my mind is is sort of like a training, like I'm building a basis of knowledge with AI, uh, that I think is going to be really advantageous when I enter the professional world. And I think students that aren't taking that time now to learn how to use it and how to apply it to what will eventually be like their work or, you know, their industry are going to fall behind. And just like Pranav is saying, you know, those people are going to be phased out essentially, uh, and I don't want to be one of those people. So, yeah. Great. Uh, Chris, I saw your hand. Thank you, Ethan. Can you repeat the question one more time for me? Yeah, I'm just sort of coming back to that question about that you all just answered around the workforce and really saying, talk about it individually. What does it mean to you and how, how what, is, what can SF State do for you as a student for that individual concern or that individual, you know, sort of exhilaration you have? about moving forward into a workforce that might be a little different or a lot different. Totally. Thank you for that. I would say within my department, which I was aware going into, it's more of a theory-based program and prepares you for a PhD. And while I deeply value the knowledge work that we do within my department, discipline, et cetera, and I wouldn't trade it for the world, I also have critiques for a changing work- workforce. And to echo many of our my fellow panelists here to be like, school is always lagging behind, right? And people who are cheating are going to cheat and all these worries. Um, I'm very worried about my future employment, mostly because of the ignorance of the kind of knowledge work that humanities and social sciences carry, right? Those stigmas of that's soft skills work, like it has nothing to do with most professional settings. And 
our jobs, which are seen as more creative, are the first to be automated in a lot of ways or like cut in many ways, despite like there's even more of a need for it now than ever and moving forward. So I'm concerned for the lack of interdisciplinary or hopefully at some point transdisciplinary learning that needs to take place, not just within my own department, but across all departments on campus. So I would say campus-wide, university-wide, there needs to be more of that and to kind of get out of this box of disciplinary work of I'm just an English instructor, I'm just, um, you know, a math instructor, et cetera. And that can be a very difficult task, especially when we as instructors aren't paid sufficient wages, among other things. And as a graduate teaching assistant, I might as well be teaching for free by the amount of pennies that I get paid on a monthly basis. So I will leave you with that. Thank you. Uh, Pranav? Yeah, I think like uh, one of the things I was thinking about like broadly in terms of education, and this is like maybe even disconnected from AI, is like, okay, like why do we really come to college anymore when like all the information is like really available on the internet? And sure, there's like many answers to that, but like I think specifically in the lens of AI, I feel like, yeah, like we got to change a lot of things in terms of like, what is the knowledge that we impart upon our students? Like, what is the coursework that we that we carry out? What are the tools that we encourage them to use that enable them to get employment? But I think like in the many ways that employment will change, in the many ways that the workforce will change, I think those will not be, a lot of that change will be around like, okay, how many, like maybe companies used to be hundreds of thousands of people and now there's like tens of thousands of people. There's those dynamics change. But I think one thing that remains consistent is that economies run on people. People work together. And one of the things that I feel SF State has lagged throughout my experience there, uh, throughout my time there, is the lack of community among students and the lack of social interaction among students, whether that is in the classroom or whether that's outside the classroom. And so I feel like one of the biggest ways value can be added to student life is by encouraging a lot of like in-class participation, like a lot of like discussions. These are truly things that doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter if you use ChatGPT for the discussion because at the end you have to say it out of your like you have to say it, you have to hear it, and then you have to critically respond to it, whether that's with aid of tools or without aid of tools. So I feel like the true value, like one of the key ways in which universities still add value is that they bring people who want to learn uh, a specific thing that they're all interested in by virtue of having enrolled in that class into the same room. And so we need to take advantage of the fact that they are in the same room. Because if you're just doing one-to-many communication, they might as well be like this on Zoom. And so I feel like building community, encouraging inter-student interaction, and interpersonal interaction and building those skills is still going to be important regardless of how we carry out the actual knowledge work, which is just tokens out of a language model. Thank you. Thank you, Pranav. Um, Avi, anything to add before we move on? So yeah, um, I think then again, Pranav hit it hit the nail on the head again over there. But I think what he's talking about is something called passive learning. I mean active learning, active learning. I think in SF State, I have seen I've only been here, this is my second semester, but there has been a very big difference in the, my previous university in terms of how students communicate with each other or if they do communicate with each other at all. And just back to the idea of, of AI, AI has allowed me to brainstorm a lot more and therefore share my ideas and my opinions with my peers and have just there and then developed better social skills and uh, language skills or whatever it may be. But then again, those who want to be there and learn about the topics are the ones who are going to like use AI for that. If they see it as a as an option to cheat, they they will do it just to get the grade. Great. And um, to the audience, um, if you have not already, uh, feel free to submit a question into the Q and A. I'm going to take a question right now um, that I suspect is coming from our tutoring and academic support center um, because, well, you'll see. Um, they ask, because there's so much disparity across the campus in terms of using and supporting students' utilization of AI, in what ways can the university or the tutoring and academic support center more specifically work with and or educate students to support their ethical use of AI? Um, so any thoughts on that? And I think we have our director here who maybe asked the question. Um, but any thoughts about that? Pranav? Yeah, uh, I think the same, I think this theme was touched upon a little bit in our intro, Andrew, in which you talked about like how we should think about the digital divide, which like what the second order implications of that could be with regards to AI. And I think there's layers to that as well. 
So like when we are talking about tools like Google Gemini or ChatGPT, there's tiers to these tools. So there's like the free version that you can use when you just show up to the website. And then there's often like monthly subscriptions that you have to get in order to get the best, most latest, greatest model. And there's going to be disparity in terms of like which students can afford to access the best models and those who can't. And that's going to create like different outcomes for them, both in terms of what they're able to learn from those tools and what they're able to like produce using those tools. And so the same way the university provides, like, so like what can the university concretely do about this is that the same way we were provided with like, for example, the Adobe Creative Suite for like a whole host of like editing and video editing and image editing, manipulation software and creative suite software. The same way we could do some sort of partnership with one of these larger companies to offer students either discounted or free access to these tools. And like one concrete example of a university that has done this is Arizona State. They entered a direct partnership with OpenAI and their entire campus gets access to the enterprise version of ChatGPT and the latest models. And so like doing something like this could be very interesting uh, because it would allow all of our students to use uh, uh, be on an equal playing ground and use like the best and latest and greatest tools. And we should kind of take advantage of the fact that all these big labs that we speak of are just down the street. They're they're in downtown San Francisco. So we should just go and have a conversation and maybe try to strike some partnerships. Chris? Yeah, so uh, despite, you know, researching and specializing in uh, AI ethics, I, I feel it's also an oxymoron statement because uh, no AI built under or incentivized by money or capitalism can be considered ethical. And while I believe it can be tremendously transformative, and I think there are so many ways that we can support and engage our students on campus, we can't really talk about AI ethics unless we're actually talking about the ways in which there's political biases, like scripted responses when you ask ChatGPT or et cetera about Israel and Palestine, um, whether you talk about how it affects identities and who is more likely or prone to use AI. So, for instance, there's more emerging uh, research to show, and I'll, I'll share the article in the chat. Um, BBC published this article about a few months ago. But men predominantly use generative AI more than women, and I would argue this also applies to marginalized groups who have more of a mistrust because of historical oppression, et cetera, against our groups, for queer folks, for people of color, et cetera, people part of a diaspora like myself. Um, and so I think unless you're addressing those aspects as well, then it's kind of counterintuitive or very one-dimensional to engage students because it's always and ultimately going to affect us individually as well as collectively. So you have to find that balance. Ethan or Avi, any response to this question? Uh, yeah, just really quickly. So addressing that um, for task, what I would say, you know, having seen some students come into, um, you know, academic technology looking for help, Sometimes we don't service things like that, but there's certain students um, that I feel like if they just knew about AI, for example, like we have access to Copilot on campus. Um, I, I don't love Copilot that much. It's not amazing, but I think as a, you know, as a free tool, ChatGPT 3.5 and Copilot um, are fantastic tools. And I think that, you know, TASK can push that a little bit onto students. Just letting them know that they have, you know, another tool available to them, um, maybe even just like give them the basics of what they should be using um, and just really just tell them that it's best. It's a best judgment thing. Everyone knows what is cheating and what isn't. Everyone knows what is. I mean, I argue everybody knows um, what is right and wrong to do with AI. Uh, we're, you know, we're all partially co uh, college educated. We want to be here to learn. Um, and so I think that's the main focus. So just pushing those tools out onto students uh, to really increase engagement and usage is how I think we can start closing that divide. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I think we're about to be passed an additional question here. Um, and we're heading towards wrapping this up too. So if any of you out there do have some questions, uh, let's see, next question. What kind of equity gaps should instructors be aware of around AI use by their students? Are some of your classmates falling behind? Do you see others struggling to pick up AI? Do you think encouraging AI use in the classroom can help with these equity gaps? Um, let's see, uh, whoever wants to jump in, Chris, is your hand still yeah. up or are you jumping um, in? Yeah, I'll jump in. So um, just to kind of echo briefly what I was saying earlier about these equity gaps, 
men and I would say mostly straight men because race doesn't play as much a factor in this. I've noticed the trend. This is like autoethnographically among my peers and students tend to benefit from the same people who have benefited in society historically, which is men, straight men, white men, et cetera, able-bodied men are the ones who are most using generative AI. So there's some clear disparities in who is using it out of fear of being seen as incompetent, right? Imposter syndrome for having to rely on it more and also more criticized for doing it. So if a woman uses generative AI, especially a woman of color, they're going to be like, oh, like you can't do your job right. Some white man does it and they're like, oh, great job. Ha ha. There's some clear disconnect there. And so I think ways of addressing those equity is like understanding how identity and more specifically intersectionality, whether it's bias or oppression, is embedded in these systems and services. Thanks, Chris. Anybody else have a perspective on this question? Pranav? Yeah, uh, I'd Any like to say, I think uh, there's an interesting way in which like, so like, I know we're all in agreement here about like how powerful like generative AI is and like how you're able to like provide it any prompt and like it's able to come up with these like very interesting like generations. But there's also like a, a, a counterfactual or like, or like at the same time, these tools are also somewhat intimidating because all you see is that you see a blank screen with a text box in it. And so it's not as easy as many other tools where there's like various kinds of buttons that people can hit to get things done. Here, the what you can get out of the tool is kind of what you put in and that can be limited and that can vary across students. And so I feel like while there, the step one in the right direction is to encourage usage for AI, of like off AI in coursework and in the classroom, one thing that can make a huge difference is if the instructor or they get a volunteer to actually come up to class and demonstrate how are the ways in which one can use it. This can make like a huge difference because there's, there's variance in like the motivation that students might have with regards to like going and doing the research themselves in regards to how you use it. But like just like some people will go on to YouTube and see like how to use ChatGPT to get X done, but not everyone will do that. But maybe spending like 10 minutes in class and having a student or the instructor like prompt it live to, to the class can make a huge difference because then I'm like, oh, like I never thought of that. I didn't think I could use it for this. And so just seeing it being used in class could be very interesting. And another benefit that comes after comes out of like showing it in class is that you could kind of nudge students towards the ways in which you want to use them. Like an instructor hopefully will not copy the entire question and plug it in and just paste the answer back into Canvas. They'll do something more interesting. They'll probably be like, okay, there's like five points discussed in this paragraph. Like help me, help me like, like organize my thoughts around it. So, so the prompts can be much more interesting. So I would say just demonstrating usage in class can make a huge difference between people going home and trying it out for themselves. And while we're plugging our promptathon coming up in the chat, uh, Ethan, you I think you had something to say. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to mention that uh, like I think faculty uh, could take advantage of events that we're hosting like the promptathon, which really engage faculty in ways to bring um, AI into the classroom. So you know, an event like that, which is really just showing faculty how you can bring it into the classroom, is I think going to translate into more students being feeling more comfortable, at least, to use technology like that. Um, and I think hearing from an instructor that using AI like is okay is going to do a lot more for students to go out to, and try that um, and make the effort to learn it on their own. I think the problem right now is that there's just a lot of fear around this new technology, just like I think there is every time there's a new breakout technology. Um, people are scared, people are weary, and I think that the university needs to jump ahead of that and really push students to take that jump and, you know, make the effort to learn. Great. I've got one last question here, and then I think we're going to wrap up here. Uh, do you all think AI instruction of some material, such as statistics or probability, should be something that SFSU should develop, leaving human instructors for more complicated topics entailing greater interaction with students. Any Anyone, I'm just going to open it up. I see you shaking your head, Chris, so that's a no. <laughs> um, just to jump in real briefly, I'm very apprehensive with AI replacing any human instruction. Um, if you look at any research from the Asian Journal of Distance Learning, they've done a lot of research on automating these roles, and it's been very unsuccessful. And the burnout rate, the dropout rate is tremendous, well above 60%. So while a lot of us, like myself, struggle with math, statistics, 
et cetera. We all have our difficult subjects. I don't think it's um, it's going to be the solution. We need that human interaction. And if I could just jump in there, um, I, I think the human interaction thing is extremely important. Like for me as a student, the reason I pay to come to this school is to hear the perspective of my professors. I'm not, if I wanted to just learn about, you know, how to man, like do a management class, I could have gotten a certification online or just looked it up on Google. I'm here to learn and get the perspective of my professor. Um, so removing that human element to me takes away all of the value uh, that the school is offering. Um, you know, I could just be doing an online university at that point. Um, so I would hope that, you know, professors, you know, people want that human element. I think it's really important. I will say tutoring uh, with, ChatGPT is a super effective way to teach yourself um, tutoring prompts and like one-on-one -on -one uh, teacher's aid type of prompts are really effective. You can Google them online. There's already like preset prompts written out, uh, but it's really, I've used them before. I think they work great, uh, but that's still, that doesn't mean that we can just get rid of instructors. Anyone else? Yeah, I completely agree. I think like, to the second part of that question, yeah, I think we should do whatever it takes to increase like greater human interaction. But I feel like AI here is like a bit of a shibboleth because like, like I'm not quite sure what it means to build AI instruction of material because like we could always just record the literal lectures that are delivered in class and upload the videos of that. And yeah, sure, like maybe AI helps you like cross question when you couldn't do that before. Uh, but like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely certain what it means to build AI instruction. And so, yeah, I'd just generally be skeptical of like, of doing that and replacing the human instruction part, because like Ethan said, I think it was a huge, huge part of like why I chose to come to school anyway. Uh, and, and yeah, like there, there, there's probably more work to be done in terms of like the delivery style of lectures. Like maybe your lecture shouldn't be just you come and you do one too many to delivery but you kind of spark, you like put put out a question and then let people discuss, share their ideas, and then kind of deliver uh, deliver your thoughts in like tandem with those. But, and so like, yeah, eff efforts towards like in student interaction there are welcome, but I don't think you just replace parts of instruction with AI. Thank you, Avi. I'll give you the last word if you have one. So yeah, I mean, I, I do not know much about this topic, but Definitely, I, I would like to be taught by a person over an, over an AI bot. I don't know. I don't even know how that would be done, like how we could generate a, a robot to, to teach. But a big part, like again with, with Ethan, a big part of why I'm here in, in university is to, um, to learn from the experiences that my professor has obviously experienced. But, but yeah, I'm, I, I do not want to say too much because I, I'm not actually too sure about this all. All right. Well, for our faculty viewers um, who uh, may be concerned about being replaced by Instructor Bot 2000, uh, at least for this panel, there's some serious love for our human instructors here. And um, so um, that's really reassuring to hear. Um, and as we move to wind down this panel, I want to first thank our panelists, Chris Leahy, Avi Malgomerti, Pranav Mattel, and Ethan Cortez for joining us and for being open to share their perspectives with our audience here. Uh, this panel will be recorded and shared out on the AI website at ai.sfsu.edu and probably also in other places as well. And um, as Robin shared at the beginning, there's a lot more programming taking place around this. And I want to highlight the work that Academic Technology and CETL are doing together um, to what we call help sense make as a community all of the challenges and questions and complicated issues that are resulting from generative AI and what it means to higher education. And there's a lot of time that will need to be taken to kind of understand it. But we, I think, feel really strongly that for SF State to really understand it well, we need to come together as a community. And uh, part of our community is our students. And so this panel today, I hope, was helpful to all of you visiting and all of you watching this later um, to help get a little better sense for where our students are coming from 
And I'll just mention that Academic Technology, CEDL, and ITS are going to be fielding a student AI survey to pick up on their perce perceptions, uses, and other feelings about AI so that we can also begin to capture that more methodically and scientifically. And so hopefully that's something we'll begin fielding here in spring and we'll be continuing on um, into next academic year. So um, I wanna thank our audience for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's really great to be able to do this in front of people, but we also know a lot of folks are gonna watch this on their own. So for those of you watching later, thank you for sticking through to the end if you're re hearing this. So. Um, Everybody have a really great day and um, we hope to see you at other AI functions and events and any other things that AT offers or CETL offers, please join in. Thank you and have a great day.